Okay, welcome everyone. We are very happy to have Dr. Megan Grega here. And she's been doing some pretty cool stuff, making a difference in her community. And we've asked her to tell us about that. And hopefully you can get some inspiration ideas on how you can make a difference in your community uh, from her passionate um, process, if you will. So Dr. Grega, tell us a little bit about yourself professionally and personally. Well, thank you, Dr. Freeman. I'm so excited to be here because I think this is a really important topic across the country of how to make the healthy choice, the easy choice in everyone's community. And that's something that we can all do as a grassroots um, sort of effort. But as far as for me, so I'm a family doc. Um, I went to the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, which was awesome. And then uh, trained in family medicine at Hunterdon Medical Center and then spent a bunch of time actually as a medical officer in the United States Navy. Uh, and then eventually decided to move back home to my hometown of Easton, Pennsylvania, which uh, here I've done some things like being the uh, director of women's health at Lafayette College. And I'm also actually adjunct faculty for a family medicine and an internal medicine residency program at St. Luke's Anderson campus that is implementing the lifestyle medicine residency curriculum. But I think when we talk about my passion or my ikigai, like they say in the blue zones, that would be my role as the co-founder and chief medical officer of Kellen Foundation. Now, Kellen Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit that really focuses on taking lifestyle medicine initiatives out into the community. And I know we're going to talk a little bit more about what all those different things are. But for me as a family doc, it was so frustrating and um, really challenging for me to be able to help spend the time and uh, support my patients into making the healthy lifestyle choices that I knew was going to be most uh, helpful for them, for their life and for their health in just my clinic. So we could do a little bit during my office visits, but what really was important was what was surrounding them and their families in their, at their workplace, you know, where they live, work and play. And that was something that was difficult to uh, impact from the, from the clinic. And that's why Kellen Foundation was born, so that we could go out into the community and try to help change those social norms so that we are all kind of living in what I like to think of as creating a blue zone in a way, creating a place where the healthy choice is the default and that you are more likely to live a longer, more vital, healthy life in those communities. Very cool. So obviously you are passionate about this and we didn't quite get to it yet, but I actually did my internship at Geisinger oh, yeah. there in Pennsylvania and then mm -hmm. later was in Reading running a primary care clinic and doing lifestyle medicine out of there. Oh, I'm so sorry you I moved. <laughs> I, I understand what you're talking about in terms of the health challenges of that area. Mm -hmm. uh, Berks County, when my wife and I first moved there, we were so impressed with just the, the general uh, size of the populace, if you will, yes. individual <laughs> size. Yes. We just kind of said, oh, it's the, Berk, the Berks bulge. Mm -hmm. you know, and not putting anyone down, it's just it was striking the level of obesity. And the decrease in uh, physical activity. Like if you look at our yes. county statistics, unfortunately, um, we're now to the point where over 30% of the population is considered obese. So not just overweight, but obese uh, is less than a quarter of the population meets the physical activity guidelines. So we can kind of go on and on, but when, when you look at our statistics, it's easier to be unhealthy here than it is to be healthy. And that's what we're trying to flip the, the um, switch on. And especially for our kids, because if this is how they're growing up and they think this is normal, this is exactly what's going to happen to them and their children is going to go on down the generations. And we already see that with a diabetes rate, a diagnosed diabetes rate of about 12%. Yes, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So you're functioning in a context like much of the country where there's a lot of illness, there's a lot of lifestyle disease and a lot of challenges. So as you've done what you've been doing, tell us what you've been doing. Give us the story. How are ah. you making a difference? What did you start doing? What did you move to? And then at the end, we're going to talk about what might other people do that are similar to what you've done. Ah, wonderful. I love this story. So I was actually, you hear a lot about doctors and burnout, you know, over time. And um, when I was earlier in my career as a primary care family doc, I was getting very frustrated with the issue of childhood obesity. So I was seeing a lot of kids in my practice that um, were definitely in the overweight or obese range, but even more importantly, they didn't have good cardiovascular fitness. You know, they couldn't run. Um, I was taking care of their parents and the, I knew that their parents had high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol. And I thought like these kids are headed right in that direction. What can we do to kind of turn that train around and, and put them into a healthier um, position. And so when I tried to figure out a way to do that within our hospital system, I said, okay, well, where can we refer these kids to? 
And my administrators who were great people, they just basically said, there's nowhere that you can um, refer them because they don't have a billable diagnosis. They don't have diabetes yet. They don't have hypertension yet. Uh, they're just overweight. And I said, well, do we have to wait till they get sick, you know, <laughs> before we do something to try to make this better? And I mean, that, that isn't what any of us in the healthcare world want to do, but they basically said, well, you know, there's, there's not really anything else that we can do. And I said, well, how about if we send them to a dietitian? would that be okay? And they were like, nope, cause not billable for them either. And I was like, okay, well, how about if I just start to do group visits with my families, which was very, un nobody was doing group visits back then. So they were like, what in the world is that? But I said, how about if we can do some group visits and, and they can just see me more frequently and we can try and work on food and choices and exercise and all that stuff. And they were like, nope, it's not billable for you either. And I said, well, then what do we do with them? <laughs> they basically said, just send them to the Y, which I think the YMCA is awesome and does a lot of really great programs, but that's what caused me to decide to create Kellen Foundation outside of the medical world. So, so what, you're, what you're speaking to, I just want to call out here, the healthcare system has no current mechanism for doing health. Right, right. And that's what healthcare. I learned. <laughs> But there's no mechanism for actually doing health. It's all about disease. So that's a really important thing to understand if we're going to pursue solutions in our communities that are real and tangible. The healthcare Absolutely. system is not built for this period. Mm -hmm. And it's so much less expensive on a return on investment standpoint to keep somebody who's maybe a, a 12 year old from developing diabetes 10 years later, and then they're going to have diabetes for, you know, 30 years or something, maybe longer. It's so much cheaper and more effective and also kinder and just, you know, like the way we would all want to live our life to, to intervene before the problem happens. But as you said, unfortunately, that is not how our reimbursement system works. And so there's a lot of um, really innovative docs around the country trying to come out like, how do we get around what our current system is? Because our current system is not about creating health unfortunately yes. at all. And, and I'm, I'm assuming that you're also doing these services, not only for those before they get disease, but also for those that have disease, correct? Cor correct. Yes. And so that, as we get farther along into the Kellen story is looking at ways to really use food as medicine or, you know, group support as medicine in a way so that people are surrounding themselves with a support group that maybe they're going and walking, you know, on a regular basis or sharing potlucks, though not right now with COVID, but a lot of the things that can help make it easier to st stick with these changes that we know um, keep people healthier. And so when you said like, how did we get started? We got started by doing um, intensive behavioral lifestyle change programs for kids with overweight and obesity and for their families to try and teach them more about nutrition, very practical stuff, you know, like really, how do you, how do you make food that your kids will eat that would be healthy for them and physical activity, it's add structured physical activity as a part of it. For us, we use martial arts at that point because martial arts is one of those things that first of all, kids think it's cool. So it's easy to get kids to participate because they think it's cool. But besides that, it really doesn't matter what your baseline fitness level is. And you can have a class of really super athletes and a class of kids that have just started. They can all get a good workout on the mat because it's not like it's all about what you yourself are pushing yourself to do. So martial arts is great. Dance is great. There's a lot of different things that you can get kids involved in to get them moving. That's not like competitive. And that's part of the problem sometimes with um, sports programs, even though I love sports programs and for for lots of kids, it works really well. But for the kids that are not very athletic or physically are a little bit not as cardiovascularly fit, they often end up spending a lot of time on the bench and then <laughs> that ends up not being a lot of physical activity. So, so we, you started this trying to help kids. Yeah, kids is where we started it. Okay, but then cool. we really realized that um, the kids are, are a critical piece because they're the ones that are going to be making the choices for themselves as they get older and for their own kids. But we also realized that families will change for their children in a way that they may not change for themselves. So ah. if you focus your efforts on children, a lot of times the adults in the family will change because they are trying to help their child, whereas they may not make those same changes themselves. And then you start to pull in the grandparents and then you've got everybody kind of involved in the same program of, of healthier eating or more exercise, yes. things like and that. And so what you've discovered is actually really, really important. What is it that actually brings about family system changes? And it's mm -hmm. often not how we tend to approach it. It's not sitting with dad who has the diabetes. It's the kid with the obesity. Oh, It'll can I tell you an awesome story? That's exact. That's one. And so it was later in my uh, journey with Kellen where this came out, but that's exactly a, um, 
a, a very important point about how should we be looking at our interventions because we were doing, Kellen Foundation at that point was doing a uh, intensive behavioral change session with, uh, for kids. And it was in one of the family medicine residency programs. So we had probably about 12 kids, but whenever the kids would come, the parents had to come too, at least one. And so we had one girl who was probably about 12 and she was going through the whole process, but her mom and dad always came, which was really cool. And, uh, you know, we talk about food and exercise and all that stuff. And we we're at the last session before we went into the maintenance time, we were at the last active session and the dad who really had been pretty quiet the whole time, uh, put his hand up and said, can I tell a story? And we said, sure, by all means, we'd love to hear it. He got up and he said, I didn't tell anybody this, but right before we started our, this program with you, I lost my job. And he said, I uh, have diabetes and I'm a long distance truck driver. My A1C was so high. It was, I think he said 13 and I lost my license. And, and he's like, and I was so just upset about this that I, he's like, I didn't want to talk to anybody about it, but I came here with my daughter and I just started doing the things that you were asking her to do with her. So we started swimming at the Y, started eating a little bit better. And he said, I just want to let everybody know that my most recent A1C came back low enough that I'm getting my job back. And I was like, that's, and I didn't even know wow. that. Like he wasn't even our patient really, <laughs> you know? But, Perfect example. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so that was really one of the first inklings to me where I was like, this is the way we need to shift the way we provide healthcare because this is the, uh, the results that you can get. Yes. Awesome. And that's what makes it fun for us doctors. Oh, it's right? one of my favorite stories. Stuff, it'd be, oh, it'd be so depressing just doing regular stuff, but seeing these kind of changes yeah. is exciting. It, it's rewarding. It's fun. Mm -hmm. And so we see that sort of thing at the mobile market, which we're going to talk about too, where, where people, um, are just not used to cooking with fruits and vegetables, but they recently get diagnosed with diabetes. They get a voucher to come to the mobile market and then they get recipes from us and it, it becomes so social. Then we hear their success stories and they are excited to come talk to us about their success stories. So it's like a, a self-reinforcing cycle. Yes. So you just touched on one of the other principles. That's the social dynamic. Yeah. So, so give us a rundown of what you're involved in at this point. So we still are doing intensive therapeutic lifestyle change programs, but we've actually uh, switched over to using the CHIP program because that is a, um, I'm sure a lot of your, your listeners have heard of the Complete Health Improvement Program with Dr. We, we, won't, we won't assume anything. Okay, that's a, that's a good point. So that's, um, th that program is very similar to the one that we started with, with Callen Foundation that we kind of created on our own. But uh, we have found that that's an excellent one to do out into the community because of some of their... Um, other things that they do. So we use that. And CHIP stands for? Complete Health Improvement Program. Okay, good. Yep. Thank you. Uh, and the, um, so we use that one along with some Kellen additions, which are some of the um, cooking and, and food and things that we use with that. So and we're I still actually, doing... when, when I was doing the primary care clinic there in Pennsylvania, we were running the CHIP program out of our clinic. So. Oh, that's awesome, because we don't have any place here in the Lehigh Valley other than us that's doing the CHIP program. So see, it's a small world, comes on back, <laughs> comes yes. back. Uh, but we have found that to be a, um, it hits all the things that you and I were talking about, the social part of it, the, the relationship part of it, and um, that works very well out in the community. So we do that. And then we also um, have done started doing things with the local elementary schools. So that's called Kellen Schools. And we started doing that because we realized that it, unless we can shift the culture and the social norms in our neighborhoods, we're still going to be in a situation where everybody's using, you know, kind of high calorie sweets for their fundraisers, right? And like try to find something healthy to eat at a football game. It's, you know, almost impossible. Actually, my son was a, is a, a soccer player. And when he was in high school soccer, I was part of the booster club and I was always complaining about the, I was saying, you know, like the, the stuff that we have available for these kids to eat and for all of us to eat is not the best choices. And so they're like, all right, Dr. Greg, that's great. So you have to now make a healthy thing to bring every game for us to, uh, to sell. And, and we did. So I started making uh, cool. three bean sweet potato chili and all that. But the thing is, once it was there, people ate it. You know, so it's, it's the, it's, you have to have it there for people to make the choice. But so we people out of it almost all the time. People don't think that people going to a sports event are going to eat something healthy. They think it has to be a hot dog and soda pop mm -hmm. and ice cream and whatnot. You have found that is not true. Right. You just have to have you it have there. Good food that's healthy and it's there. People will eat it. Mm -hmm. Does it have Actually, to taste yeah. good. 
As long as it tastes good. Yes. And I actually yeah. had a lot of parents come up to me and say, thank goodness, because I did not know what I was going to eat for dinner. And at least, you know, we had the either the chili or the, you know, like uh, different things that we brought. So I think uh, going into the schools and teaching the third, fourth and fifth graders about things like eat real food, what counts as real food, what sort of things do we eat that really aren't real food. And, and we define real food as things that are healthy for your body, give you the nutrients that you need, fill you up, not very processed. And um, we sing, we sing songs together. We play detective games together. We talk about being a food detective and that they're old enough and that like kids want to be independent. They want to make their own choices. So teaching them, like, if you have this versus this, what's your healthier choice? And even if you don't always choose your healthier choice, at least you should be able to figure out what it is. And kids can kind of, uh, relate to that. And then we also have, um, in fourth grade, we teach about label reading. So red, yellow, green, and uh, that sort of classification system of healthier foods versus less healthier foods. And in so fifth you're grade, talking about, do, okay. I'm, hearing, I'm hearing two principles that are really important. Mm -hmm. One is it's fun. Oh yeah, it can't be boring. You're singing, fall, <laughs> singing songs, you're playing games, it's fun. Mm -hmm. Healthy living is fun. Yep. Number two, it's practical. I'm hearing practical. How do they identify specific things, real world examples? And they love that part. Yeah, because that's what gets them involved. They'll be like, they'll raise their hand and they'll be like, well, how about Gatorade? Is that healthy? Or, you know, I don't want to use specific <laughs> things, but, but sure. once you get them thinking about it, then they start processing like, hmm, what are some of the things that I have in my lunchbox or that I'm eating? And they want to know, like they'll, they'll raise their hand, they'll, they'll take something out of their desk and say, is this healthy? <laughs> you know, something from lunch. <laughs> so it kind of, it piques their interest as opposed to just coming one of the things I never want um, kids to feel like is that eating healthy food should be boring and not taste good. You know, like, so we, we have to talk through if you have the option between pretzels or Doritos, what's your healthier choice? Or if you have a, I mean, everybody knows that grapes is the healthiest choice. That makes sense. But if you had the option between hummus, which a lot of kids don't even know what hummus is and, you know, hummus versus um, cheese whiz or something like what's your healthier choice. And, and they're in third grade. So they're starting to process through these, these things. And that's going to be really important for them as they get older to be able to make healthier choices, because most of why we buy stuff is just because of what the packaging looks like. It's because of what we're used to. It's because of what's in front of us. So getting kids to start thinking about how can they impact their health in the long run. And believe it or not, a lot of them care about it because a lot of them already have uh, relatives that have diabetes or have heart disease. So They've seen the effects of it and they don't want to have that happen. See, this, this should be standard education in our country. Yeah. For the kids. We need, we need to put you in the department of education or something here. Oh put my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the key part of it too, is the relationship part. There is so much yes. um, technology out there and technology has its place. I, you know, we wouldn't be able to have this discussion if we didn't have technology, you and I right now, but that's not the best way to always make kids make different choices. You know, like, so you kind of have to have the relationship over time, showing them just a quick video or something, or, or having them play a video game about healthy food. That's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that's, that's bad. I'm just saying it's not enough. Like you need to have more yes. adult interactions with them. Um, I've seen lots of kids eat things, try things because they, have had a relationship with me long enough that they know I'm probably not going to give them something gross. And so therefore they're willing to try it. And um, they also come up to us out when we're out in the street um, with the mobile market, things like that. They know us. And so then they're more likely to try whatever we're sampling out that day. Though I have to tell you, some of the parents don't always know that they know us. And so they get freaked out because their kid comes running down the street to give us hugs. And the parents are like, who are you? <laughs> yeah. And we're like, well, we, we, we work with them in school. <laughs> you know, like, you know, we always wear our green Kellen t-shirts. Then people know who we are. <laughs> yeah. But it's, I mean, it's the same thing with the gardening, getting kids gardening and doing school gardens. Really so that's another like, piece of what you're doing. Yep, absolutely. So that's part okay. of the school programs as well as we do interactive in classroom programs for third, fourth and fifth graders. And then we also build school gardens at uh, many of our elementary schools that the kids can grow some of their own real food. And then that's a great way also to get the parents involved. So we do the planting with the kids in the spring. We go back a couple of times. Um, we have a salad day because that usually grows here in Pennsylvania before school is out. But most of the rest of the stuff grows over the summer. And then we have more of like a harvest festival in the fall. 
but we need to get people involved with the gardens over the summer. So it's a great way for kids and their parents to become a part of the school garden. They weed and water, but they also harvest so they can take the food home and, you know, either have it themselves, share it with their neighbors. And kids are so proud like of what they grow, which is amazing. And it was just a couple of weeks ago, we were cleaning up one of the gardens at the end of the year and kale grows forever. Like kale is a wonder plant because at least here in Pennsylvania, it, you plant it in the spring and it is going until frost. Like you get so much kale. So there was still a lot of kale in the gardens and the kids were helping us clean it out. And to see them run to their parents being so excited with these bags of kale that they had just harvested, I was like, See, if you just showed that, them that stuff in the grocery store, they'd be like, mm, I don't know if I want to eat that. But the fact that they planted it and they harvested it, you know, they're going to go home and try and cook it. <laughs> yeah. So we're getting human beings, kids in this case, back in touch with nature. And yeah, normal and they human love it. Process. And it also helps their learning so much because it's tactile kinesthetic, you know, so it's, it's not just having them memorize something. They come out and they grow those cherry tomatoes and sweet pepper plants all the way from seeds then they come back and see how big they got. Then they get to actually harvest it. Cherry to tomatoes is another, uh, I always think of it as a gateway drug for vegetables. I mean, I know it's <laughs> technically a fruit, but like, <laughs> because for kids, they love, I mean, like that's like candy. If you get a, a sweet cherry tomato right off the vine and it's all warm and juicy, like that sort of tomato gets kids willing to try things. Same thing. Take note with, everyone, uh, gateway drug for healthy eating. Yep. Vine ripe cherry tomatoes. Yes, that you grow yourself if you can, yes. if you get it all. And we talk a lot about actually container gardening because a lot of our schools are in areas that uh, they may not have a yard or they may not have something like that. So a cherry tomato plant is perfect for that. So is a pepper. And so are greens, you know, putting them out. So most of the things that we grow with the kids are things that would work in a, in a container garden as well so that they can you know, take it home through the summer, that kind of thing. So I, I really feel like with the school programs, that's involving, actually, we are in nine different school districts. And last year, we visited over 400 unique classrooms of third, fourth, and fifth graders. So that ended up being over 10,000 students that we see year after year after year. And that sort wow. of relationship is part of what makes the behavioral change easier. But it's also because it's all of them. You know, it's not just the kids who are in one class or the kids that are in one school, like, if you're doing it through the whole school district and you're doing it through the whole neighborhood, it gives them a common language to talk about, you know, it's like, and they're, and they're more likely to like the teachers will send us little notes. I love where they say the kids are like at, you know, an after school activity and they're looking at the snacks going, is that a red snack or is that a green snack? I, you know, <laughs> you know, so it's like something that they, oh. that they can sort of hold on to and use. And I think the fact that it's, we've been doing this, I think since 2009, so some of the kids that we started with are now graduating from high school and they still come up and see us um, on the streets when we're there with the mobile market and talk about like, you guys are the healthy guys. And they, and they tell us like what they're going to go off to do in college and like that. So that's family medicine to me. <laughs> you know, It's like taking and, people all the way from kids to, to grownups. And what else you're describing here is healthy living should be a means of facilitating fuller, more connected living. Mm hmm. Yeah. So we often think of, of, of healthy living and making good choices, just giving education and giving them information. Healthy living should be facilitating connection and community. Exactly. And then that and, hits and that another one of, of dynamic, those pillars. That flip of dynamic really makes things work. Exactly. Because another really important piece is the social connection piece for all of us. Like humans are, are social beings. And if you're the well, only kid, yeah. You know, if you're the only kid who's sitting there uh, eating carrot sticks or something and everybody else around you is eating, you know, something that's not as healthy, it feels weird, you know, and it's or the yeah. same thing for parents. If parents are trying to get their kid to eat things that um, their neighbor, then when a neighborhood child comes over, they're like, ah, I'm not going to eat that. It's like those are difficult. And we actually have a discussion about that with the kids in our classroom. We, we talk about don't yuck my yum. And they, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Don't yuck my yum because what some, <laughs> what some kids will do, cause we eat together in the classroom too. Some of the stuff that they grow in their garden and um, you know, we bring in food from our commercial kitchen. That's, that's plant-based. And so we all do little tastes and, and we talk about how your taste buds change over time. And that uh, just cause you don't like something today, doesn't mean you won't like it later, but just give it a little try. And if you don't like it, that's fine. You know, put it down. You might like it when you're older. And that's always a key one. 
You might like it when you're older. <laughs> That's good. No. That's good. <laughs> that always makes kids go, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm not old enough to like this. <laughs> but because of the, sometimes you'll have kids that overreact um, to the taste of whatever it is. We, we, we preface it by saying, if you had a favorite t-shirt, one that just made you so happy to wear it, and you came to school and somebody laughed at you and said, why do you wear that? That's such a gross t-shirt or that's so yucky. Like, why do you wear that? Like, how would you feel? And every kid is pretty much like bad. (laughs) I said, exactly. So if somebody loves a food, it's like one of their favorite foods It's one of the things that their family makes and it it means a lot to them and they eat it and you're sitting next to them going, that's disgusting. That's gross. Like, how would that make you feel? And they get it. And when I say, that's why you don't yuck my yum. My yum might be different than your yum, but you don't have to, you know, act like it's disgusting because, and you can get into bullying with that. And and there's like, like you said, there's so many different pieces of the relationship. A lot of it, we think about food, but it's, it's a lot more than that. It's how do you live a a happy, vital, you know, life of meaning and, and, you know, what do you say? Living my best life, you know, doing, (laughs) doing the best that you can. And food is a piece of that, but really relationships and, and your tribe is an, MP, an important yeah, piece Yeah, awesome. Too. So do we have a complete picture of what you're doing now? Oh, so we're missing. So we talked about the intervention programs. That's more Kellen lifestyle medicine. Talked about the school programs. That's Kellen schools. Uh, but then we also started doing something called Kellen Kitchens, which is going out into the community and doing six to eight week cooking classes with kids, families, seniors, so that we can all cook together and then enjoy the recipe together and sit and eat. And it, so that's a social thing too, but it's also to help people taste the food that you know we're kind of recommending that people eat more of and see how delicious it is. Because if you don't know recipes to incorporate whole grains or, or broccoli or, or more kale, things like that, and you don't know how to do it, or if you, you most, you know, nobody wants to spend money on food that they aren't going to eat. So if they get a chance to right. eat it first, then they're more likely to do it later. And uh, that's a piece that we've integrated into the CHIP program where we, we feed people every every week as well when we see them. And they have talked about how that is, those participants have said that's some of the most important behavioral change you know, uh, strategy that they had out of the whole program was tasting the food and realizing like, I could, I could eat this, you know, this would be something I'd like to do. So the Kellen Kitchens is using that strategy, having people using food, actually tasting food, and also the social time of eating and cooking together to help people see the steps of what they could do to change and shift their diet. So that's really important. And then the last piece is the food access piece, because if you want to eat this food, but you don't have access to this food, then we're kind of asking people to, you know, like, be Superman, like fly, like none of us can fly. So we have to be able to have that food available. And unfortunately, the Lehigh Valley has eight uh, areas that would be considered food deserts or food insecure areas here. So wow. what, what we've done, yeah, and that, that's a big chunk of our population. So what we've done with Kellen Foundation and with some amazing community partners uh, that have been helping us with this, like Two Rivers uh, Health and Wellness Foundation and the United Way, is we have um, a, a 24 foot trailer that we take into the areas, into these neighborhoods, 11 different sites a week. And they're the same sites every week. So people can count on us as their kind of healthy grocery store on wheels. And we bring in fruits and vegetables and whole grains so that, and actually healthy prepared lifestyle medicine meals, which are done back in our commercial kitchen. So that we kind of try to like get, get the, um, get rid of all of the different obstacles. You know, we've got the actual ingredients there, but if you'd rather just pick up a power bowl or a, you know, 32 ounces of chili, we've got that too. Uh, we bake our own bread. So we bring in bread into the, into the neighborhoods and we accept um, cash and credit and debit, but also EBT and which is the uh, food stamps or SNAP benefits. And we also do the WIC and FMNP, which is the farmer's market nutrition program for women and children, but also seniors so that we try to make it that any way that people uh, have the, the resources to get this food that we can make it as easy as possible for them. And it also helps our local farmers because we are bringing in as much as possible food that's grown in the Lehigh Valley or nearby regionally. 
And I mean, if it's not in season in the Lehigh Valley, we'll get it someplace else. You know, like bananas are never going to grow in the Lehigh Valley. So, and everybody likes bananas. So we, ha- we have those too, but apples and potatoes and onions and melons and all that stuff in season are coming from our local area. So the, the uh, food access piece is also, I think, critical because it changes the choice architecture of a neighborhood. They get the same thing like when we were talking about the sporting event. If the healthy food's not there, no wonder nobody eats it. You know, it's not that they wouldn't eat it. It's not there. Well, same thing. If you don't have fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains in your neighborhood, well, of course, it's going to be hard for people to make that change. So right. that's been a big piece right. of what we do, too. Very cool. Very awesome. So it's sounding like we're shifting the culture. We're making a significant difference in many people's lives from the kids to the parents, to the families, to the whole community. Mm-hmm. How are you making this work operationally? You've got a foundation. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. If someone wants to make a difference in their community, what have you found successful? Mm-hmm. What are the principles? Awesome. One back step before I get to that, which, cause you said about how do you make cha- make the change in the social norms? The other key thing is in the healthcare system changing the social norms ah. of the doctors and the people that are, are referring these patients. So I think one of the, the most important things that we do is the fruit and vegetable prescription program where doctors or other healthcare providers, mental health providers in our, in our area can actually give their patients a weekly voucher for fresh produce. So I, I talk about how, you know, as a society, we pay for people's statin drugs. We pay for their diabetes drugs, you know, not everything, you know, but, but in general we do, um, we don't pay for their food. If that, it could be food as medicine. So we have different, uh, prescription voucher programs where patients will get anywhere from 10 to $20 a week at the mobile market. And that really shifts the conversation with their healthcare providers about showing how important they think this is. And we've had, uh, amazing, um, I want to say compliance because that sounds so much like drugs, but but people coming <laughs> week after week after week to the mobile market. It's working. Yeah, it's working. It's working. You know, we have, we have uh, a lot of repeat customers. That's a good way to put people it. People are filling their prescriptions. Yeah, they're filling their prescriptions. And the thing is, it, it's also shifting the thought process of the doctors and the um, health, the mental health providers who are choosing to do this, you know, because they're thinking, okay, this is somebody that I want to be eating more fresh fruits and vegetables. How do I do it? Now I've got a, a, a fruit and vegetable prescription program to do that. And, who's and social determinants of health too. That's another one that we're starting to look at in the Lehigh Valley. Some providers are doing it based on social determinants of health as opposed to um, disease process. And for our viewers, social determinants of health means? Ah, very good. So social determinants of health would be like, where do you live? What's your uh, economic status? Uh, things that have to do with like, do you have transportation? So social determinants of health are in a way can tell you risk factors as far as whether somebody is going to be able to access some of these healthy lifestyle things that, that we're talking about. So who is yeah. paying for the prescriptions? $10, so $20 that, a week? Yeah. And so that is a very multidisciplinary group of people, which is actually a great segue into the whole foundation thing too, which is you have to find a lot of different stakeholders. So as far as the fruit and vegetable prescription program, we have uh, St. Luke's uh, University Health Network is paying for some for their patients. Lehigh Valley Health Network is paying for some for their patients. Pinebrook Family Answers is paying. Uh, that's a that's a mental health provider in our area. They're paying for some, and then we also have Two Rivers Health and Wellness Foundation, who's paying for some in their catchment area as well. Um, and we just recently received a grant from the county uh, to do it for Northampton County. So what we do is we piece it together from lots of different um, organizations and make the case that this has a really good return on investment down the line. Now we don't have all the data to show uh, changes in biometrics because that's a, that's a pretty big study to try to do, but we can show levels of engagement and we can show um, how people, what they're choosing to buy, which is actually a very important um, piece for people to realize just because you uh, like CSA boxes are awesome or giving out free food is awesome, but patient choice makes a big difference as to whether they're going to eat what you gave them. And so we can, we can sort of gather that information and feed it back to our um, healthcare partners and things like that. Okay, cool. So CSA community supported agriculture box of produce Mm -hmm. um, as one of those options. So you're actually getting healthcare to pay for some of this, but it's not coming through normal payment mechanisms. You're having to do something very special. Right. It's definitely through their philanthropy arm. (laughs) Now, the other thing that I've learned is very key that I'm seeing and hearing in your situation, you can 
clarify this for us is this is coming from you largely. You're spending a lot of time and energy. Is this all volunteer? You're getting paid at all for this? Um, so, what is it that's going to make this work in other situations? Ah, Do they need yes. another Megan Grega? <laughs> well, I think, um, well, first, let me say that it wasn't just me. I also have a co-founder, Eric Ruth, who is a business guy. So it turned out perfectly to have a physician and somebody who was in finance yeah, and good. accounting and marketing and all that sort of stuff. So we could put our, put our heads together and put this together. Now we also have an executive chef. Uh, so she really helps us out with all of this. We have a registered dietitian and we have other people who are um, what we call healthy lifestyle educators that go out into the schools and everything. So when I say all that, Kellen Foundation has now been in existence for 13 years. We did not start out <laughs> with all of that. And as far as how do you start, really, we just started with uh, Eric and I having a passion for changing the community. And I would recommend for anybody doing this, start small and find something that you can do that you can continue. Because the worst thing I think for communities is when people um, with well, very well-meaning, but come in with programs, they're there for a couple of weeks or a couple months or a year, then they go out again, and then they get funding a little bit later, and then they come back in with a new program, it's a little different. And they, I mean, I understand why that happens because funding for all this stuff is really challenging. But you have to treat this in the same way that you would any sort of a business plan and figure out where does your funding come from. So one of the best places, I think, to start, um, especially if you're not a physician, start with the schools or start with uh, community cooking classes. You know, something that can be small. Pick one school. Do a school garden. You know, do some after school gardening clubs, stuff like that. The key is to start making the relationships. And as you're making those relationships, you figure out, oh, hey, this particular Rotary Club wants to adopt this school. That's great. Okay, now you can put them together and, and get the funding to do that. Or, uh, for example, you know, this uh, Department of Agriculture grant is focused on something as far as getting local produce into areas of food insecurity. Hey, we have the infrastructure to do that. Let's let's do put that together. So start small. Start a place that you can continue, and especially is good if you already have a relationship with that place. So. For example, for the schools, we started with the Easton Area School District, which is where I graduated from. And I was also the doctor on the, um, the wellness committee for Easton Area School District. So I knew all the players and it was easier to get the um, classes up and running. It doesn't have to be your school. It could be a senior center nearby. It could be a community center. It could be the YMCA. But pick something that uh, you already have an interest in and then start doing these healthy lifestyle sessions, whether it's educational or whether it's just cooking or whether it's just gardening. And then you'll start to, to get to meet other people in your community that are interested in the same thing. And then you start to see places that you can partner and collaborate and work together and it'll grow. But I think it's very hard to start with like, I would love to have told you that the healthy neighborhood emergent strategy was in my brain when we started and when I said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. It grew over time saying, oh, there's a need here. Can we fill that need and figuring Good. out how to do it? And I think that's the key is start small, make sure that you can be sustainable and it'll grow from there. And I heard several other things. I heard business process, business plan, mm -hmm. very yeah. important, especially if someone wants this to be sustainable long-term. And I heard also not sporadic funding, figuring out mm -hmm. funding mechanisms and structures, even if you have to pull it all together, that can be ongoing and consistent versus, oh, we got a grant one year and we may or may not get a grant ever again. Mm -hmm kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So very important. And at this point, what uh, your, your staff that you referred to, how many of them are sustained employed mm -hmm. doing this versus still volunteer? So people so have I, realistic expectations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would say about four. Of, so we have some um, staff over the summertime and over some of the, the really busy season that are more college interns, things like that. And so they're more seasonal staff and they're, they're okay. paid. Uh, but when you look at our overall for the year, I would say there's uh, three staff that are basically full-time being, being um, paid through Kellen Foundation. And then there's others that are hourly that are paid certain number of hours a week. And that may not be their only job that they have. Um, there's me who's kind of like, mostly volunteer, you know, a little bit here and there uh, that I get paid, but mostly it's, it's more of a volunteer thing. But the um, volunteers, like, like you were mentioning, 
the key with volunteers is having some trained staff that can be the structure that yes. the volunteers can integrate into. So we often will have one volunteer at a mobile market site and two or three Kellen paid staff. And that works well. Now, uh, a garden, you can often get people to be volunteering through the year at a, at a school garden, and they just need to touch base with our garden coordinator. You know, that person touches base with them a few times during the summer. So it depends on what project you're talking about. I have had healthcare providers talk to me about how can I do this and um, leave my other job, basically, <laughs> of what they're doing. This type of work does not get reimbursed at the same level as what our current healthcare world is like. So it's not, so, so you shouldn't expect that you can make a physician salary doing this type of thing. However, you can um, definitely make a inroads into that direction. And as, as when we talk about our other paid staff, you know, they're getting paid at a reasonable amount, but it took us years to get to that funding level. So we sometimes, yeah, sometimes you have to have part-time people. Sometimes you have to have hourly people. But what I've noticed is the big, the more you put synergy into your programs so that one staff member can be a, what I would think of like as a utility infielder can go to lots of different programs, the more you are able to put together a package that works for a full-time person. So if you're doing yeah. just one program, unless you're doing a huge amount of that program, it might be hard to get somebody uh, up to salary for a full year. But so cross-trained. Yeah, cross-trained. That's exactly. And we are all team players. There are times that I'm in the kitchen chopping underneath the executive chef because she knows what we need and we just need some extra hands in there, you know. But there's also times that people are coming with me to help support the CHIP program teaching. And, and so, like, we all kind of have our strengths, but each of us can help the other um, team members. Good. So... For another discussion, that we, there are some inroads that we're collectively making into getting providers paid for doing lifestyle medicine. Yes. It's definitely yes. not where it needs to be by any stretch of the imagination. And hopefully at some point, we're going to get a more proportional value for reimbursement to make this more mm -hmm. functional. But in the meantime, we're never going to get everything into the clinic space and we don't want to. Mm -hmm. So it becomes largely a matter of how do we do what you're describing, network and collaborate with those in the community that would be good partners to start to transform our community, transform our social context, the social determinants of health, if you will, to keep us from getting access to fresh veggies, from knowing how to prepare them, and that mm -hmm. are starting to get food into the flow as medicine. Mm -hmm. Even if it's hobcobbled together at this point in time, we're at least making headway, we're showing what could and should be and moving forward. When we get, so I, I agree with you, there are ways in our clinic spaces now as physicians that we can practice lifestyle medicine and figure out a reimbursement model that works. So right. if I see a patient in my office and I do a nutritional counseling or, you know, do a group visit, I can figure out billing usually that will make that work, especially if they already have a chronic disease. What's really challenging is how do you get paid to go out and teach a bunch of third graders? You know, like how do you, how do you do right. that? And that, that has to be, or how do you go out to a senior center and teach a cooking demonstration. You know, how do you do that? Our funding mechanisms in healthcare don't currently support that, but maybe they will when we get to the point where we are looking at how do you keep a whole population healthy? Because then we're gonna need to have community partners like Kellen Foundation or the United Way or whoever out there doing the actual work on the ground to get people the food, to get people the education, you know, to, to manage the school gardens. Because I can't see that our healthcare systems are gonna be able to take over all of that. But if they are looking at their own patient populations and saying, okay, I know that I will be able to um, decrease costs if I have less people that have their diabetics or their A1C out of control, how do I work backwards into the community to make that happen? That is, I think, where the funding stuff will come from. But there's also the, um, the looking at things like like you mentioned, the social determinants of health and how do you fund things to help people who are going to be more um, unable to access these things on their own. And I, I think that there will become more innovative funding ways to do that as well. Yes. So this has been very inspirational. Thank you so much, Dr. Grega. 
Oh, it has and, been my pleasure. Thank you. And I hope that our, our listeners and viewers will find a lot of inspiration, a lot of really practical tips in here too. Really important practical tips for long-term success. So let's all take a lesson from Dr. Grega's experience. Um, hopefully you took lots of notes and can apply those in your own situation. It is quite a challenge in today's environment, but is very doable and is so rewarding and gives so much to those around us as well as makes our life really fulfilled. And that is fundamentally what lifestyle medicine is all about. It's about living healthy, happy, and whole. Thank you, Dr. Grega. Thank you so much. And I absolutely agree. If this is what you want to do, you'll be able to find out a way to make it work. So just keep trying. And like you said, do what you love and what it'll all follow from there. So thanks again, Dr. Brayman. Thank you.